I am assistant professor at uh, Jaizan University College of Engineering. Uh, I am interested in uh, human factors engineering and patient safety culture. Uh, this evening, you will be hearing a presentation from Dr. Uh, Nazih Al Uthmani. He will be speaking to us on safe hand handling of medical devices within healthcare uh, facilities. Dr. Nazih is a strategist, technology transfer, innovations, World Health Organization medical devices expert, and associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at King Abdul Aziz University, uh, deputy secretary general at King Abdul Aziz, and his uh, companions foundation for giftedness and creativity. Um, seeking to contribute in uh, promoting and building the ecosystem innovation and technology transfer and play a role in uh, localization of best practices in technology innovation, management and uh, commercialization of ideas. Received his PhD in electrical and uh, computer engineering from the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, the master degree in the same field from the University of Michigan, uh, the master degree from uh, King Abdul Aziz University uh, in Jeddah. Dr. Nazih is a member of Medical Devices Committee as well as the Scientific uh, Council for uh, Dental and Medical Technology at the Saudi Commission for Health uh, Specialist. He is also a founder and a board member in uh, Rufaida Women Health Society. Uh, he held many positions, the vice uh, uh, executive president for Saudi Food and Drugs Authority, uh, consultant for uh, deputy minister of health, consultant with King Abdul Aziz Foundation uh, for Giftedness, um, and many other public and private entitled. His areas, uh, of expertise includes uh, strategies, uh, uh, instrumentation, uh, signal and uh, image processing, biomedical applications, innovation, uh, technology transfer, and entrepreneurship. He uh, holds uh, two patents for medical devices from the US Patent Office, published uh, multiple papers in peer reviewed uh, journals, and co author a textbook electrical engineering uh, measurement technologies, authored a novel uh, scholarship uh, journey between uh, Easternizing and Westernizing, uh, delivered uh, dozens of local and international uh, speech. Uh, webinar in technology, innovation research, biomedical engineering, localization. Uh, he also has a blog, Be the Change You Would Like to See where he writes blogs in his areas of expertise. Um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, we need to, I would like to remind you that the abstract uh, submission for the third uh, Saudi Patient Safety Center patient safety is open. Kindly scan the barcode or visit uh, the web page to uh, submit. Um, kindly notes that the question will be at the end of session and uh, post it in the question and answer icon so our speaker will answer them uh, guidely. Uh, so uh, let us uh, move to our session and please welcome Dr. Nazih Al Uthmani to deliver the presentation on this uh, very timely subject. Welcome in, Dr. Nazih, and the mic is with you. Assalamu alaikum. Is my voice clear? Yeah, it's it, it's clear. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Majid, for this introduction. Um, we'll be talking about uh, safe handling of medical devices, risks associated with medical devices, and uh, I will not be talking to biomedical engineers. I will be talking to users, uh, healthcare professionals, and specialists in general. Uh, so I won't be going to too much details uh, on uh, procedures that usually done by biomedical engineers to ensure the safety of medical devices. But before we can go there, it's important to understand what is the definition of a medical device? How do we define 
uh, what we call a medical device. And there is a, a, a recognized definition because there is a there is big confusion even within our local healthcare facilities about what constitutes a medical device. Uh, the WHO and Global Health uh, Global Harmonization Task Force uh, (GHTF) uh, definition, which is even um, adopted by most of the uh, regulatory bodies around the world in medical devices and even the World Health Organization. It's called any instrument, apparatus, implant, machine, appliance, software, material, software, I emphasize software, material, uh, or any other related or similar item that is used for diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, treatment, elevation, compensation, investigation or replacement, modification or support of anatomy uh, for any uh, disease or injury, but it performs its duty and it performs its intended task by physical uh, means, not, uh, pharma, not pharmacological, uh, nor immunological, uh, nor metabolic means. So there is no uh, engagement within, cell, uh, within the cells of the body. Uh, if we see the what is the difference between drugs and medical devices, this is the actual difference uh, because drugs are also used for, uh, some drugs are used for diagnosis, for uh, prevention, and even for, for uh, treatment and elevation of pain. However, drugs usually uh, reach their intended use by pharmacological or immunological uh, metabolic means, uh, while medical devices uh, reach their goal by physical uh, means uh, purely. So this is how we differentiate between a medical device and drug. And according to this definition, even surgical gloves are considered medical devices. Uh, syringes are medical devices. Uh, medical cotton are also medical devices. Alcohol swabs are medical devices. IVDs, these are all medical devices. Many people think a medical device is those X-ray machines, lab machines, uh, infusion pumps and uh, ventilators and all these things, which is not the case. Uh, medical devices are uh, a much broader definition and much broader uh, concept. So what I'm, what I'm talking about will include both uh, things. So in medical devices, they can be used actually in the first line of dealing with any patient, no doctor. There is no doctor, uh, no doctor, no matter how specialized or uh, how much experienced he or she are, they will not be able to properly diagnose a patient before they use a medical device on the patient. Uh, the first device is usually the thermometer or uh, the blood pressure monitor or even a scale. Uh, these are all medical devices and then they usually prescribe some tests, uh, some exams uh, to help doctors identify where the problems are. So medical devices are used for diagnosis. Uh, many of them are now uh, utilize artificial intelligence, uh, internet of things, wearable devices. They are used for treatment. They are even used as softwares for automatic detection of disease to help uh, physicians and doctors to understand that there's something wrong in the lab tests or in the X-ray images. So when we say about, when we talk about safety, we mean that, I mean, safety, uh, uh, is a situation where is no harm is, is, is taking place. Uh, so a person is saved from even pain or injury or loss. Uh, and of course, there is no such thing called completely safe. We usually try to avoid conditions that may uh, lead to medical errors and minimize risks uh, when dealing with medical devices. But there is no situation where uh, it's completely safe, it's completely harmless. It's, so there will always be something uh, some risk. So when we talk about hazards within the hospital uh, uh, environment, there are mechanical hazards, chemical hazards, electrical, environmental, biological, radiation, user-related uh, errors and deviation. These are all risks associated with uh, medical devices, and we'll try to cover as many of them as we can. When it comes to mechanical devices like mobility aids, transfer devices, prosthetic devices, mechanical assist devices, patient support equipment. These are very helpful devices, very helpful machines. However, uh, they can be dangerous. Uh, they can cause harm and injury to the user and to the 
uh, even the uh, hospital staff. So it's important for nurses and hospital staff to uh, look for sharp edges. Sharp edges are uh, sharp edges, leaking fluids, uh, parts that are moving, especially moving parts. You don't want your hand to be in front of uh, something heavy that is moving. Uh, loose, detached parts, uh, screws that are not tight, uh, uh, tires that are not uh, fixed properly, uh, things are not uh, wobbling while moving. So this is these are really uh, critical uh, la, 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 things to note uh, when you deal with uh, mechanical devices, especially devices that transport patients. Are they fixed? Are they uh, properly uh, installed? or not, otherwise they may cause a lot of harm and a lot of danger. Environmental hazards can be caused by medical devices, by solid wastes, uh, noise, uh, utilities like natural gas uh, and, and, and wastes in general, lab chemical wastes. Every hospital need to have separate uh, drainage for uh, chemicals going out of the labs, uh, lab machines, uh, the specimens, all these things need to be uh, put in mind. You don't mix chemicals with the regular drain, they have to be, uh, they need to have a special drain and uh, they need to be collected in a specific way and uh, discarded in a way that is not uh, harmful to the environment. Unfortunately, many times we see incidents and photos spreading around the net uh, about people uh, throwing away drugs or even human specimens in a very, in a manner that is very dangerous to the environment. Of course, when it comes to biology, uh, to uh, environmental hazards, there is also biological hazard where there is infection, infection control is required. Uh, uh, machines uh, have a lot of specimens from patients. Uh, patients could be infected with uh, rare diseases or uh, bacteria or viruses. So it's important to pay attention when dealing with such machines and devices. Don't touch uh, everything without uh, having proper uh, cleaning and uh, sterilization process uh, done. And of course, uh, the, the surgical tools need to be sterilized properly. And sterilization, by the way, is one of the uh, critical uh, uh, things that are usually ignored because not ignored, uh, it's important to read the instructions for proper sterilization. Sometimes uh, people use, let's say, uh, steam sterilization uh, with a device that requires chemical sterilization. And sometimes people use chemical sterilization with devices that require only steam sterilization. So it's, it's every device, every machine uh, has its own instructions uh, for use for sterilization. So it's important to, uh, to adhere to those instructions and make sure that we sterilize machines properly before we reuse them. Uh, another thing, a single use device, this is also sometimes common. A single use device is a single use device. You cannot reuse a single use device. Uh, sometimes uh, we have noticed when I was in the Saudi FDA that some hospitals tend to somehow reuse single use devices and uh, this is really dangerous. Uh, it may cause biological hazards. Uh, all of these things are important uh, to put in mind. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, devices that are used by patients. Radiation, another radiation hazard, uh, X-ray machines, uh, nuclear medicine machines, uh, oncology machines. Uh, these are uh, machines that require special handling. Uh, all staff members need to wear uh, TLDs uh, and, or uh, TLDs on, their, on them continuously while using this these machines, they need to be monitored to make sure that they didn't, were not exposed uh, uh, more than uh, what they're supposed to. Even this is another practice that is need to be uh, uh, practiced in our uh, hospitals, uh, which is monitoring the patient dose uh, for an X-ray machine. Are the patients being overdosed or not? Uh, is the machine delivering the proper dose or not? I mean, if you set up the X-ray machine, for a certain amount of dose, is the machine actually delivering that amount or more or less? If the machine is delivering more than what it's supposed to, then there is a, a risk on the patient. If it's delivering less, then uh, the image quality will be terrible. 
Uh, so a constant uh, uh, monitor to this uh, dose uh, needs to be done by medical physicists or by medical engineers. And then once if uh, deviation is detected, uh, service need to be required to fix that. Uh, but handling the radioactive material, I mean, we have seen hospitals where radioactive materials uh, that are uh, used, radioactive materials are installed with, 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 uh, with the drugs, with, uh, with uh, like cottons within the same uh, supply room. They take out these uh, radioactive materials. Of course, now the Saudi FDA with the Ministry of Interior are uh, doing a lot of uh, visits to hospitals around here and there to ensure that there is good handling of uh, medical uh, waste, medi medical radioactive waste, to ensure that it is uh, put placed in isolation uh, in, uh, in in strong lead uh, insulated parts and when discarded, they are discarded in a way that is not dangerous or harmful to the environment. Uh, now, people are talking about cyber hazards, uh, pacemakers, uh, and even uh, glucose pumps, uh, especially these implantable devices. Uh, they cannot, uh, I mean, if you want to put, uh, enforce a strong uh, uh, firewall to prevent uh, cyber attacks, and prevent people from hacking into them, you will need to add extra hardware and you will need to add extra uh, software that will drain the battery much quicker than it was supposed to. So usually these devices are very simple uh, to ensure that the battery uh, would, would last for at least two or three years uh, because you don't want to put a device in and after two months you discover the battery is over and then you have to uh, do surgical uh, procedure to remove the device and put another one. Uh, so these are very simple device, and uh, usually uh, they are susceptible for uh, uh, hacking. So you can imagine somebody with a pacemaker that is programmable uh, through Wi-Fi enters into a room where there is a wi strong Wi-Fi signal and the pacemaker reprograms itself. Uh, so that's, that, that's really uh, something that's dangerous. Uh, I'm just putting an example for an FDA recall. Uh, to, to, to close half a million pacemakers uh, over hacking fears. Pacemakers, um, infusion pumps, these are all, oh, any device that is connected to the internet is uh, subject to uh, hacking or uh, interference. Usually big devices like infusion pumps and ventilators, they, it, it's okay to add uh, protection, uh, hardware protection to uh, make it difficult for hackers to enter. However, you will not be able to put the extra hardware and extra steps in, in implantable devices. Uh, there are essential principles for safety and efficacy for medical devices. This is a, a well-spread document. Uh, there are uh, eight to 10 principles for essentials of safety and efficacy for all medical devices around the world. Um, it is published by the International uh, Medical Device Vice uh, Regulatory Forum, uh, uh, and it's also adopted by the Saudi FDA and most of the uh, regulatory bodies uh, around the world uh, ensure that any device, what manufacturers do, they, uh, they must submit documents to the regulatory body to ensure that their device design and usage meets these uh, procedures. Um, one of the essential principles is the intended the proper use. Uh, and this is something very commonly uh, noticed in hospitals, adverse events. Uh, a medical device uh, must remain safe and fail safe as well, if used for the intended and uh, for the intended use in the method and the means identified by the manufacturer. Uh, sometimes uh, devices fail and they cause harm to the patient, not because of the design, it's just because the nurse or the hospital staff is not using it properly. Uh, so it's important to maintain in every department, you have to have the instruction for use manual uh, near the device. If it's a home use device, by the way, if it's a home use device, the instruction for use manual has to be in Arabic. If it's not in Arabic, you must report it to Saudi FDA. It will be recalled, it will be removed from market. If a home use device does not have Arabic instructions for use, 
uh, it will be removed from the market. And there are many examples for such wrong use. Uh, this is a real case in Saudi Arabia. Uh, a nurse uh, 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 installed a ventilator. They installed a ventilator on a patient. Uh, the ventilator was uh, plugged into the wall. However, there was no electricity in the socket. So the ventilator was working on batteries. Uh, all ventilators are designed to uh, send an alarm when the electricity is low or when there is no electricity coming from the wall. However, the nurse has muted that uh, ventilator. Uh, it muted it, so there was no sound coming. Uh, and the, the ventilator remained on the battery for some time. And of course, it failed after the battery ran off after a couple of uh, hours. So the patient died. Uh, now, who, whose fault is it? It's not the fault of the device. It's, it wasn't used properly. Uh, laser guns, for example, in, in cosmetic clinics, for example, laser guns, are uh, some of them are intended for facial. They could be used for vaginal uh, treatment. Uh, this is something also that was reported in uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's important. It's important to have the to use the device for the intended use. The instruction for use manual says this device is used for one, two, three, four, and actually, device is usually licensed licensed for this purpose for the intended use that is identified for the instruction for in the instruction for use manual. Unfortunately, some people out of ignorance or purposely, they think it's okay to use it in another fashion. Uh, another common problem we see electrosurgical units, uh, the ground plates, ground plates uh, expired. Well, the plate expired, it looks clean, it looks fine. So doctors tend to use it. And uh, what happens is it doesn't provide proper grounding. So when the electric current uh, starts cutting, it burns the patient back because of that. So these are many of the uh, problems uh, that were detected. These are real cases, by the way, uh, detected in Saudi Arabia. Another important fact, uh, uh, it's important for people to be aware that there is a current whenever, when there is a device connected to a patient, there is a current running through that patient whether we like it or we don't like it. Not only patients, even us as we are sitting now, there are electromagnetic waves uh, around us. These and our body behaves as an antenna. So these electromagnetic waves will enter into our body through currents and reach the ground. This is a fact of life, unavoidable. It's happening. So don't worry about it. It's okay. You're currently sitting now and there is current running through your body. Now, the problem uh, in hospitals is that when patients have multiple devices connected to them, like uh, infusion pumps, uh, patient monitors, uh, catheters, uh, and, and, and more and more of these devices, some, sometimes you connect three or four infusion pumps, ventilators, uh, anesthesia machines, or uh, so once when these devices are connected, uh, there is more current running through the patient. So that's why uh, it's important to run electrical safety tests uh, on these devices. These are done uh, by uh, qualified biomedical engineers. And it's enough if 10 microampere, 10 microampere, micro, 10 to the minus 6 ampere pass through the heart of a patient, it will cause a heart attack. 10 microampere. Uh, it's, it's a very small current. Usually these devices currently now, they, they work in the range of nanoampere, but however, if there is a problem in the device, the leakage current will increase. So it's important to put that in mind. Uh, and, and, and usually uh, patients, uh, uh, biomedical engineers need to do electrical safety tests. Uh, and I will talk to you about the importance of these tests and how well we are doing with them. Now, this is, uh, this is a device. It could be a ventilator. It could be an anesthesia machine. It could be patient monitor. I'll be talking about the ground wire, the third wire. This third wire has nothing to do with the operation of the device. If you disconnect that wire, the device will still work. However, what they usually do is this device, this wire is connected to the chassis, to the chassis of the device, the outer body of the device. Uh, 
so in case there is a problem in the electrical circuit inside the device, the current will uh, pass through this chassis and go through the ground wire outside instead of going through the chassis and then entering into the patient. If there is uh, a good ground wire, uh, then the, all the leakage currents or most, the vast majority of the leakage current will go through this wire instead of going through the patient. Now, uh, what is uh, commonly used with people is that they break this ground wire. They break the third pin. Now, uh, luckily now the uh, Saudi Engineering Council has a strong code. However, still some hospitals do not use uh, the proper uh, uh, plugs and we're still using two types of plugs. So uh, people think that it's okay to break this ground pin because the device will still work. Yes, it has nothing to do with the function of the device. However, if there is a fault in the machine, if there is a fault in the device, then this pin will protect the patient or the user uh, from being electrocuted. By the way, this is also important in homes, washing machines, refrigerators, uh, ovens, uh, toasters. Uh, it's important to keep this wire on because these devices carry a lot of current and sometimes a loose wire uh, will uh, attach to the uh, chassis of the refrigerator or the, uh, uh, or the washing machine and uh, somebody comes and touch it and it gets heavily electrocuted and that's really dangerous. Uh, keep your eyes open for, uh, of course, these things, these extensions that I in the, never use them in a medical device. Never. They are not supposed to be used. Extension cables are not supposed to be used with medical devices. Install the machine next to the plug. Don't use an extension cable, period. Uh, if you need to use it, use it temporarily for 10, 15 minutes, something urgent, you have to do it, that's fine. However, for long term, never use an extension cable. You have to put the device near the plug and never use these uh, extensions. These are very dangerous. And keep your eyes open for, uh, for such open wire and broken wires that are usually broken by uh, chairs, sliding chairs or something else. Uh, this is something I saw myself, by the way, on the left side, uh, they put a plug and they put 110, 220. Now this is diminishing with the new uh, building codes. However, there are still some old hospitals who are still using these types of uh, plugs. And they think that uh, putting a label of 110 or 220 prevents somebody from plugging the device and burning the transformer uh, because of it. Another common thing is connecting 10, 15 devices on the same uh, plug. Uh, this is really, I mean, uh, dangerous because uh, the more devices, each device will draw its own current. And so the internal wire in the wall will carry the sum of all currents. So the, if the internal wire in the wall was not thick enough, it will start burning. The insulation will start burning and it will cause a short circuit and a fire will take place. So please, Yanni, this is something really crucial and uh, important to put in mind. And not uh, this has to be avoided even at homes. Uh, reduce, I mean, minimize uh, having this, this type of uh, engagement. Uh, one common problem, when you go to an ICU or you go to an emergency, alarms are for alarming. When we hear an alarm, everybody needs to be on alert and everybody needs to be on, on, on their toes trying to find what is causing this alarm. However, oftentimes now you enter into an emergency room, you enter into an ICU, you will find infusion pumps, you will find patient monitors that are just alarming. Tee, 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 tee. And the nurse, because of the settings on the machines, uh, are, are causing the machine to send an alarm. The machines are not connected to anybody. They're just standing there, alarming. So the alarm sound, uh, so the nurses and the staff and everybody in that area uh, become familiar with the alarm sound. It's uh, when it's not supposed to be the case. When you hear an alarm, everybody needs to be on alert because that's, that's the whole purpose of an alarm. If the alarm sound becomes something familiar to everyone, then it defeats its purpose and it becomes a dangerous thing uh, because a, a real alarm may take place and, and nobody, everybody would think, oh, this is one of those machines that are on the side 
sending the alarm. So this is something very important. I think uh, a policy needs to be implemented in hospitals uh, to uh, if there are uh, standalone machines, their alarms need to be silenced or something or uh, uh, not have this sound alarm sounding everywhere without anybody caring. This is the electrical safety machine analyzer used by biomedical engineers. Uh, 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 a rule of thumb, a rule of thumb, a rule of thumb. Any machine that is measuring something, measuring whatever, you have an indicator that shows you a number, 10, 15, whatever, whatever that number is, temperature, weight, concentration of a chemical thing, uh, whatever number you think, that machine, that machine will deviate. This number is not necessarily true. If it's showing you 10, Let's say, for example, you have a ventilator. You're setting up the uh, whatever uh, pressure. You're setting up the pressure for, let's say, 100. The machine says 100. But is it actually delivering 100? That's a separate thing. The machine may say 100, but what it's delivering could be 90 or could be 110. An infusion pump, you set it up for a certain number. Uh, and you're assuming that what is being delivered by the infusion pump is the same number. It's not necessarily the case. It could be more, it could be less. Uh, so there are test equipments to test all measuring devices to verify whether what they are delivering is actually what is written on that monitor. 80% of Ministry of Health hospitals do not do these tests. 80%, this is a study that was done by the Saudi Health Council uh, on multiple hospitals in the Ministry of Health specifically. This is not the case with uh, National Guard, not the case with armed forces, not the case with the uh, uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, these three hospitals and the uh, armed forces, these hospitals, they, they always do tests and validate that these numbers are correct. Ministry of Health, 80% of hospitals don't do that. So this is extremely dangerous. So you may set up the anesthesia machine for a certain concentration of, uh, of drugs uh, and assume that it is actually being delivered when in reality, is delivering less or more. So the, so the patient may wake up in the middle of the surgery or uh, sleep, uh, go in a very deep sleep that uh, could cause harm. So biomedical engineers need to constantly uh, ensure that the numbers mentioned on the machine are correct and they need to put a label. So if you go and meet uh, uh, every, uh, that label needs to, some machines every three months, every six months. So you have to see that label when was the last service performed on that machine. And if it's not uh, done within the name, uh, previous six months, remove that part from service. And if the biomeds, ask the biomeds in your hospital, are you testing my ventilator? Are you testing my anesthesia machine to ensure that what is actually being delivered is the same as the number? If not, remove that device from service. It is harmful, it is very dangerous. You're assuming that the settings you're putting on the machine are correct, when in reality they are not. Uh, because nobody is testing for these devices. Uh, reading errors. So when it comes, you can imagine how uh, the SpO2, for example, oxygen monitor, uh, it's saying 98 or 99. You think it's right when the monitor is not calibrated or out of sync, when in reality it's 90 or 96. So this will cause problems. Sphygma, uh, blood pressure. Blood pressure machines are always out of uh, calibration. So a patient might be diagnosed as uh, hypertensive, when in reality, it's just a machine that is reading wrong. Uh, uh, the lab machines, I mean, uh, uh, how, how does a doctor realize that the patient is diabetic or certain? It's by numbers. I mean, if the machines are not calibrated, let's say for, the, for, for example, in lab machines, many of people working in labs, they have what it's called the control. They come in the morning, they insert this control in the machine, and they are trained that uh, the machine should read 15, for example. If the machine reads 15, they continue uh, using that machine that day. If the machine reads something else, it means that it's off calibration. So it will have to uh, call for service. This is crucially important. Unfortunately, the Ministry of Health, the largest uh, hospital chain in the kingdom, they have no policy for this. And uh, biomeds, I know many biomeds in the field are trying to enforce this. They are trying to make this uh, possible, but it requires budgets, it requires training, and usually the policymakers and decision makers do not understand 
uh, what does this mean and do not have they do not comprehend the importance of this issue so they ignore it and they just let it go uh, and, and that's a frustration for most of biomedical engineers in the ministry of health if you talk to them they will tell you we don't have test equipment so we don't know if our machines are reading properly or functioning properly and they demand it from uh, authority they demand it from uh, hospital uh, administration nobody listens because i mean no one understands what engineering is and no one understands that this is an international requirement by imdrf by who it's uh, really something alarming uh, to put in mind uh, a study was conducted uh, in uh, in one of the local hospitals uh, in in riyadh uh, uh, the sample size uh, what about was about 20% of uh, yeah, about 200 machines of high risk medical devices uh, representing six device categories to example to uh, to measure the impact of calibration uh, performance uh, on patient safety and the results was 34% of the machines failed the visual test what is the meaning visual test there are broken parts there are labels that are missing there are wires that are broken there are things that are not tight. 5% of these devices, 5% out of 200 devices failed uh, the safety test and 58% failed the performance test. The machine is functioning properly in front of you. It's, it looks fine. However, when you measure, when you compare the performance of the machine with the specifications required for safety usage, you will find the discrepancy between the performance and the standard. This safety test, are not done. Why? Because you require tools to do these tests and usually hospitals, uh, uh, not all of them, some hospitals uh, don't seem uh, see that necessary to use those test machines to verify and validate the hospital's uh, thing. So it's very important to uh, ensure that the numbers you are getting, the doctor bases his or her diagnosis on these numbers. And these numbers come from machines. If these machines are not calibrated, then the numbers the doctor reading are wrong. When the number is wrong, the diagnosis is wrong. So uh, imagine a hospital that doesn't e even check uh, what's going on and how these numbers uh, take place. It's, it's really uh, disturbing. And by the way, there is financial impact. Uh, uh, there is financial impact on, uh, on the lack of calibration uh, for uh, such machines. Uh, my clinic did a study that uh, uh, due to the lack of calibration of some machines, they are losing about uh, uh, 60 to uh, $200 million a year because uh, the machine's diagnosis uh, gives you the wrong reading. And when the wrong reading, uh, when the reading tells you there is abnormality, you need to do further tests. So they need the initial screening using machines. And then after this initial screening, they uh, when the patient is abnormal, they have to do further tests. And this initial screening uh, was uh, detecting problems because of lack of calibration. If it was calibrated, it wouldn't have detected it. Another important thing, adverse event reporting. We all have recalls in our cars. We all have recalls in our best cars. Uh, recalls and alerts from manufacturers in medical devices are a reality, are a faith, a fact of life. Even the best of the best of the best of the highest quality manufacturers will issue alerts, will tell you that the following batch, last June 2021, the uh, batch of uh, ventilators that came out of this facility had uh, problems in the design. So anyone uh, having that uh, recall must uh, fix this sensor, fix this uh, part, uh, remove this device from service. This is a fact of life. If and Saudi FDA every week issues, gathers these alerts from around 11 sources around the world and publishes a report to all hospitals. There is a person in charge within every hospital who receives these adverse events and the vast majority of hospitals ignore them. A person is telling you that if you have this device in your hospital, then there is a problem. You need to change the sensor. You need to remove it from server service you need to adjust the following you need to pay attention to the following and many people unfortunately ignore these alerts this is crucially important a hospital must enforce policies to 
have somebody in charge within the hospital to validate and verify the list of devices in the SFDA alerts, are they existing in the hospital or not? If they are existing, they have to report to Saudi FDA and they have to perform the uh, recall uh, alert on them. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be a problem. You yourself within your hospital, uh, within your hospital, if you see uh, a device that has having false claims, it's claiming that it can do one, two, three, and if it's not doing, report it to SFDA, it will be recalled, they do action. Uh, they do do things. I mean, this is real. They look forward for uh, getting these alerts. Uh, wrong information, mis uh, mislabeling, uh, missing instruction for use in Arabic for home use devices, uh, design mistakes, <coughs> wrong instructions for use. All of these things are reportable. You must report them. And uh, once you report them, uh, the SFDA will take uh, action. And there are many, many cases locally that were reported it uh, for medical device problems and Saudi FDA contacts the uh, manufacturer. The manufacturer based on Saudi observation will issue an international recall to uh, remove uh, these devices from service. One of the famous uh, problems that took place, the PIP, PIP implant, poly implant uh, prosthesis. This was, I think in 2011 or 2012, that top French company for manufacturing breast implants, the top, it's not something that is uh, a cheap company. No, this was the top manufacturer of breast implants in the world at that time. Uh, manufactured a new set of uh, breast implants. And instead of using uh, medical uh, uh, silicone within them, they used industrial silicone uh, to, to save cost. They saved money. It was licensed by uh, the European Union, uh, the factory was audited. Uh, people visited the factory. And when the auditors came, the factory was functioning uh, properly and working properly. However, when the auditors went, they removed the medical silicone and they started using uh, industrial silicones. About uh, six to 700 Saudi women were uh, impacted with this. Uh, and the report came from uh, the United States and Australia. Uh, uh, these implants started leaking, and uh, I think one lady died. Uh, and when the, they investigated, they figured out the problem, and they traced it back to the factory, uh, a manufacturing design, and an international recall was announced because the Saudi FDA keeps track of every machine that comes into the country. They were managed to uh, uh, identify that there were 600 or 700 women who were impacted with this, and they had to deal with it. This is, this is the number of incident reports for the US FDA uh, for medical devices problems around the world. Uh, around the USA, for example, in 2015, they had about half a million, one and a half million reports. This is something very important because these reports, there are people analyzing these reports, studying these reports, and trying to figure out, is this an isolated incident? Or it's, it's coming from five, six different places. If it's coming from five six, uh, five, six different places, they will immediately alert the manufacturer. They will immediately raid the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the stores that are keeping these devices and they will do something about it. So it's important for you uh, to report. In 2012, there were uh, a lot of, uh, uh, these are the devices recalled from the market, removed from the US market, by the way, which is the, highly regulated market, about 1,100, 1,200 devices were removed from the market due to incident reports and alerts. So uh, it's crucial to uh, imagine how many lives were saved by removing these uh, hospitals. In, in, uh, in Germany, I mean, in Germany, they are extremely tough with this. No device will remain in the hospital if it was not tested for performance if it was not tested for calibration, and if it was not calibrated within the past six months, it will not remain in the hospital. They put, they allocate budget, the hospital administration allocate budgets, and actually it's not the import. In, in Germany, it is not the responsibility, and the liability is not on the manufacturer, nor on the distributor. The liability of, of any problem because of this is on the hospital themselves. The director of the hospital will be liable 
if a device was found that was not calibrated or tested for performance, the hospital director will be liable in Germany. So this is something very advanced uh, in application. Now in Saudi FDA, in the new regular uh, directive for medical devices, calibration is mandated, uh, testing equipment is mandated, uh, but we still need more awareness and we really need hospital directors to understand the importance of this issue. This is not a luxury. This is not something that we do it uh, just to make things uh, difficult. This is something uh, essential for patient safety and we hope that people will uh, collaborate uh, with this. I hope that this is just to summarize again, we have mechanical, chemical, electrical, environmental, biological radiation and user related uh, problems. And uh, we can see how uh, things go. I wanted to uh, show you this, this picture. This picture usually one of the common mistakes in hospitals is that they will have six, six four or five different uh, infusion pumps within the same ICU, different manufacturer. So the way to use this infusion pump is different from using the other one, different from using the other one. Usually when a nurse needs an infusion pump, she's in a hurry. She wants to connect it quickly. So she might confuse uh, infusion pump number one with infusion pump number two or three or four. So it's important to put that in mind when uh, putting devices within one room. Nurses need to be really well trained. A nurse is a human being, even a doctor. I mean, you get confused if you are using an iPhone and you suddenly start using, a, uh, if you're using to iOS and you move to Galaxy or, uh, or Android, they, you get confused. So how about if, you, if you, there is a patient on bed and there is a, the doctor is screaming, the patient is screaming, everybody is shouting, and this poor nurse has to quickly install this machine and quickly run it. Uh, and she thinks it's the manufacturer A when it's reality it's B. It's th so this kind of uh, uh, environment is uh, makes makes problems happen. So it's important to also put that in mind. This is also one of the common problems. In conclusion, we need to minimize the risk uh, in handling uh, medical devices in general in hospital areas. There are mechanical, electrical, uh, and uh, chemical and biological, and as we mentioned, many uh, hazards. Uh, many hospitals, especially Ministry of Health, they outsource uh, man management of medical devices to other companies without uh, putting any requirement on them on uh, test on calibrated test equipment, on uh, uh, performing electrical safety tests using calibrated machines. These are not. Uh, uh, standard requirements. Why? Because they want to save money uh, on the expense of patient safety. Uh, and usually, by the way, a person may die and they say, uh, this is uh, his time came when in reality it was the error of a medical device. Uh, but as I mentioned, 80% of hospitals, especially Ministry of Health, don't perform, Ministry of Health and private sector, uh, most of the private sector and Ministry of Health hospitals, they do not do uh, test equipment. They do not have test equipment. They don't calibrate machines. Uh, this is different in uh, MODA and Armed Forces and uh, uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and some of the specialized hospital. In general, other hospitals, they just don't pay attention to this. Uh, we also need to, uh, another thing, uh, keep your eyes open, uh, play it safe. Electricity is very dangerous uh, because you don't see it. Uh, radiation is dangerous because you don't see it. You think you're safe, but when in reality, some things are happening without your knowledge. Uh, report adverse events to Saudi FDA. Saudi FDA report and act upon the adverse event report that is sent by Saudi FDA to your hospital once a week. Uh, every week about 70 to 80 alerts are sent by Saudi FDA to all hospitals. And hospitals need to have policies to ensure that somebody is uh, assuring that the hospital is free of those 70, 80 machines. And if not, if, if uh, two or three or five, they have to report it to Saudi FDA and they have to act in accordance to the alert. I hope that uh, the lecture was uh, beneficial. And uh, with this, I, have, I would conclude. And thank you very much for listening. And thank you to the uh, Saudi Patient Safety Center for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the points related to this issue. Um, and 
I think we can go for questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Nizi, for addressing this interesting uh, topic. Uh, let us move to the, sorry, let us move to the questions from the participants so you can answer that uh, questions. So uh, let's start with first question. Uh, one of these questions say, the, um, uh, how can they uh, check or know the, 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 the instruction or the manual for the old machine or devices if they don't have it? How can they get it? Well, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, every machine in the hospital, most of the machines are under contract. Uh, whether by mm -hmm. a manufacturer or by another service provider. So they can ask mm -hmm. that manufacturer to uh, provide them with the um, uh, instruction for use manual. They can ask the biomedical engineering department for the instruction for use manual. They can search the internet. Uh, now the internet uh, has a lot of uh, resources for manuals uh, for all types of machines. But it's important to have uh, uh, something to tell you what what is the intended use and how what is the proper use because don't try to uh, act smart and think that you know how to use a device uh, these devices are not your personal iphone you can play around with your personal iphone with your own uh, tel uh, television or other ma machines within your home but uh, please don't uh, try to uh, act smart uh, with machines that are connected to patients to help them uh, okay, the, another question, uh, they said, uh, how many times should be the devices to be uh, tested in, uh, uh, in the hospital? How many times in, the, in a year, maybe? Uh, some devices, it's enough once a year, uh, but uh, most of the devices, I would say twice a year. The instruction for use manual will tell you uh, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. many times for every machine, but minimum, minimum once a year, minimum, that's a minimum. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in addition, uh, what, what, one more thing, it depends on the, uh, for, I mean, um, let's say a device is used 15 times a day compared to another device mm -hmm. that is used three times a day. Uh, so if the device is heavily used, then it will require more frequent testing. If a device is not heavily used, it may require less frequent, but minimum once a year. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, saying, uh, do mobile uh, phones uh, interfere the patient mechanical medical devices, especially in a critical care setting and how? Uh, I mean, currently, uh, currently most of the devices, the heavy devices uh, are well protected against, uh, against the, the general uh, and the public use the electromagnetic waves. Uh, so Wi-Fi is usually don't, I mean, uh, mobiles usually don't interfere with the big devices. However, uh, pacemakers, uh, invasive pacemakers, glucometers, some of them might be affected if there is a cell phone uh, or multiple cell phones next to them, they might affect the programming or cause interference because these devices have less protection against uh, cyber attacks. Uh, okay, another question uh, said, what is the relation of temperature and humidity to functions of machine? Big relation, big relation. Uh, the components within the machine, the components within the machine are designed uh, to work in a specific temperature range and humidity range. Uh, if the humidity and temperature change, the characteristics of the components within that machine will change. And this will impact the performance of that machine that may not work uh, properly. So it's important, it's like a drug, for example. Drugs, for example, are mm -hmm. supposed to be kept in certain temperature. If, you, if that mm -hmm. temperature changes, the, chem the chemical decomposition decom of that drug may change and it will no longer be the same drug if you put it in a separate, uh, in a, a different temperature. The same applies for medical devices. So it's important to monitor the temperature range uh, that the device need to be kept in. Mm -hmm. um, another question, uh, it said, when the device should be replaced? Um, I can add another part in this question. Uh, uh, always there is a new version from this device. So 
if this device is working well, should we uh, upgrade this device or not? This is a very important question. Um, when do we replace a machine? Uh, actually, uh, if the device is working properly, and, in, um, mm -hmm. and it is, it's important, there are many factors that play in answering this. One of them is the economical mm -hmm. factor. Uh, what is the cost of, uh, what is the running cost of this device? Uh, maintenance, mm -hmm. are the spare parts available? Is it easy to maintain, easy to use? Is there a better technology? Our aim, we, why are we using this device? Is to, to help the patient. Is there a new mm -hmm. technology that is coming better than the current technology that could remove, reduce the uh, disturbance caused to the patient or can do it in a quick, uh, do tests in a quicker way or quicker fashion that will be more comfortable to the patient. These are all factors that are uh, included when thinking it's a collective decision between finance between planning between physicians and uh, medical engineers to decide whether the device should uh, go out of service or not. If the device is functioning properly, doing what it's supposed to be properly, and there is uh, no uh, better technology available, and there is no budget uh, available, you can um, keep using the device, uh, uh, of course, as long as it's passing all tests and functioning properly and doing what's supposed to do. No need to replace it. Why replace it? Unless there is a better technology, there is a, an importance oh. to expand or a, a device that uh, uh, that يعني, brings more comfort to the patient uh, due to use or uh, efficient or faster or easier uh, handling. Okay. Um, I like this question. Uh, it was in my mind, but someone asked it also. Who is responsible for monitoring medical devices? Uh, who is responsible for monitoring medical devices? Uh, yeah, in, I mean, checking maybe. Biomedical engineers. Them. Biomedical engineers. Every hospital needs to have biomedical engineers who are qualified uh, to, mm -hmm. hand, uh, to manage the technology. Uh, these biomedical engineers within hospitals, they help in planning. They help in evaluating the performance of machines to mm -hmm. later on decide which stays, which removes, which goes out of service, and they're the ones in charge of preventive maintenance. Every machine requires preventive maintenance, changing filters, like your car. You have to take your car every 5,000 kilometers to change your oil and filters. Even machines require that. I mean, uh, there are filters that need to be changed. There are uh, things that need to be cleaned. Uh, there are uh, chemicals that need to be replaced. There are sensors that need to be valid validated and checks. Uh, a machine is like uh, that. Biomedical engineers need to be uh, need to be empowered to do that. Uh, there are many hospitals that don't even have a biomedical engineer. They don't even have a department, uh, uh -huh. which is something uh, very alarming. Uh, these are, I mean, now people are becoming more aware of the importance. However, it's not about having the biomedical engineer. I mean, having a department that is not empowered, that is not even able with budget and training. I mean, medical devices. Uh -huh change are, are quickly changing, constantly changing. The technologies are evolving very quickly. So if, if you don't train your engineers, if you don't train your staff, uh, they will be outdated uh, and, and machines will be keep coming out without uh, nobody trained on them and uh, uh, patients will suffer. So that's, uh, uh, this is an invitation. Hospitals really need to invest in their staff. Uh, they need to train their nurses. They need to train their biomedical engineers. Do not buy a machine from someone do not buy a machine within mm -hmm. some from without putting in the contract something about uh, training the staff and training the biomed engineer on how to do the regular maintenance and how to do the preventive maintenance not just the operation usually hospitals uh, care about the operation teach the nurse teach the doctor and and they pay le very less attention what about the biomed engineer teach him how to maintain this machine Teach him what are the things he need to uh, worry about. Teach him every three months what he needs to check, what filters he need to change, what things he need to do. Uh, this is something very important uh, in, in this era of uh, fastly evolving technologies. Um, there are many questions uh, need to be answered, but uh, we are uh, in the end of our session. 
Uh, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Nazi for joining me, us today. Uh, me, just, just one thing, Dr. Yes. Uh, it yeah. is not the FDA. No, it is Saudi FDA. FDA is in America. Mm -hmm. Don't have uh, mm -hmm. authority over here. Over here, there is Saudi FDA, very active. Cool. Uh, they receive your alerts and they will act mm -hmm. upon them and they will uh, work on uh, uh, addressing all adverse events and uh, sending you reports of weekly adverse mm -hmm. events reported within the kingdom and worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, on behalf on, uh, of uh, Saudi Patient uh, Safety Center, we would like to thank Dr. Nazih Al Uthmani and the audience for their active uh, participation. Uh, as a part of the Saudi Patient Safety Center effort to uh, provide uh, you with timely topics and interesting speakers, we would appreciate it if you would fill out the evaluation survey sent to your emails after the session. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today and we look forward to welcoming you back in future webinars.